This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Um, I'm Peter Van Alphen, Chief Curator here at the American Numismatic Society, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to long table number 88. And today we have Marina Fisher, who is the Curator of Numismatics at the Nickel Galleries in, uh, at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. Um, this is one of the most important academic uh, numismatic collections in Canada, so we're very excited to hear more about this collection. Uh, Marina herself is a art historian by training. She's been at the Nickel Galleries for almost 20 years now, right? That's... I started, it, yeah. Uh, yeah. I started officially in 97. <laughs> Oh, and then so, I moved yeah. around, but in this particular role, 2014. Yeah, so she's she's been there quite a bit. She's worked quite a bit on numismatics, obviously, but she also has published a lot on uh, archaic and classical Greek vase painting, particularly depictions of women and prostitutes on those uh, vases. So uh, really quite varied and wide interests um, in ancient uh, art. So, Happy to turn it over to you now, Marina. I'm very much look forward to this. Thank you so much. And thank you. I can't say it enough. I'm really excited to be here today and um, to tell you a little bit about what is happening north of the border. And um, here we go. So yeah, um, the collection is called the Nickel Numismatic Collection and I will explain. So it's located right in the Nickel Galleries. So it's kind of really mouthful, which is actually part of libraries and cultural resources at the University of Calgary. And uh, I wanted to start with, um, oh, sorry, just one second. I wanted to start with telling a little bit about Calgary because I know that many people don't really know where Calgary is. I, I myself did not know where Calgary was when I moved in to the, no, 1995. And uh, if you, maybe the best way to kind of understand what Calgary is, it's like Houston in Denver in Canada. So that that's really what it is. It's, um, it's beautiful. So it has that uh, Rocky Mountains like Denver. Uh, but it used to be a really big uh, oil business center, like a lot of money flew, uh, uh, like literally flew through Calgary. It was like incredible place, especially like earlier. And, uh, and then we had some crashes. And now, especially in the last few decades, there have been big shifts in the economy of the place. And just the mindset has been changing a lot. But it has really everything. Like it has a strong cowboy culture. It has a strong rural culture. It has a strong urban culture. It has a strong immigrant culture. Like it's it's really everything. And Calgary is a very friendly place. It's uh, it's I I am I just have to say I'm really proud to be um, a Calgarian, and I do encourage you to check it out because it uh, it is a really unique place. One of the most amazing things, at least in my mind, uh, in Calgary are the skies. The skies in Calgary are incredible. And we also have sun pretty much 360 days a year. Uh, it is the sunniest city in Canada. This is the university campus, which is on northwest part of the city. And um, this is the, the main library or the Taylor Family Digital Library that was built and opened in 2011. This is where Nickel Galleries is located. Actually, right this box here is part of, uh, part of the gallery. And this is the entrance. And then the entrance into the gallery is right this way. Um, campus is really big. They are expanding and growing all the time. Um, with with different with recent changes in Alberta and the government policies and so on, there's been a lot of uh, reimagining of the university. And in the last fifteen years, 
there has been a lot of uh, shift to certain, maybe like engineering, management, business, and so on. However, I do have to say that University of Calgary is a really strong research university, and the, the Faculty of Arts is also really strong. The collection is not part of any department in particular, which is something I personally really appreciate because it allows me to connect with everybody on campus equally. I am uh, most closely connected with classics and religion and history and also art history, but I actually work with all departments on campus, like including philosophy and management and languages and um, can't even think of it right now, like, yeah, archeology, span anthropology, a lot of, lot of different disciplines, economics and, and so on, because the, the collection is central and it's part of the libraries and cultural resources. So the gallery, which also is a little bit confusing with names, it was originally named the Nickel Arts Museum um, then when the museum moved into the new building um, in 2012, it changed, it changed the name to Nickel Galleries. We have three main collections in the gallery. Uh, art collections specifically focusing on Western Canadian art. And here you can see the space. You can see the space. It's really incredible. Uh, large space on uh, the main floor. We have a couple galleries on the upper floor and it's very versatile. We can change walls and we do change walls all the time. This is the second collection, which is the rack collection that we have at the nickel. And then we have the, the coin collection at the nickel. The coin collection is the founding collection. It started in 1970s where, uh, when Carl Nickel and his father Samuel Nickel donated um, $1 million for the building of the original museum building and Carl Nickel donated 10,000 ancient coins to the university. So that was the beginning of the, of the Nickel. And then it, it, uh, it grew. It started with uh, the, the coin collection started with 10,000, coins from Carl Nickel. And this is why the nickel is spelled a little bit differently. It's always really confusing. It's not nickel E-L as a metal, it's nickel L-E as a last name. And uh, the nickel family is still really active in Calgary. They have nickel family foundation that continue to donate and support all the time. And not just the university, but outside in the city and other universities in the cities. There are two other universities in Calgary. So the, the coin collection from Carl Nichols in an original donation grew further to about 23,000 objects that we have in the collection right now. And this is the, the space. The, the collection is in the basement of the, of the main library. And you can see there's a vault on the left uh, in the photo. Originally, the idea was to put the coin collection on the fifth floor where uh, Arts and Culture Center is. However, the engineers and the architects did not calculate the weight of this giant concrete box uh, that is necessary to, um, to have this really secure space. And because of that, the collection ended up in the basement. And I personally am really happy with that choice because it adds extra security to the collection and all of us who follow the numismatics news, we know how vulnerable these collections are and there've been always so many thefts and problems. So I am really happy because the, the security is incredible and, um, and it's a, a right place for it. So this is beyond the vault. In, in the other room that I showed you, this is our research area. My office is there as well. We have shelves with books. And then this is inside the vault where we, where we hold the collection. So on the left are the, the cabinets, 300 trays with coins. And then in the other cabinets around there as well, we have other artifacts that we also uh, hold with the collection. 
So the collection itself, as I mentioned, it, it grew and we add all the time, both donations and acquisitions. So this is approximately what we have. The ancient Greek collection is really the largest. That is the focus. Ancient, ancient coins are the focus of the collection. So Greek, Roman, Byzantine, Islamic, medieval. We also have some Celtic coins as well. And then we have the modern collection, European, German, not Gale, Canadian, US. We have some medals as well. And we are just receiving some other uh, military medals. And then we also have these pre-coinage currencies or pre-colonization currencies that in, based on my knowledge is um, the largest collection in Canada after Bank of Canada. So the collection itself is absolutely the largest academic collection in Canada. When it comes to non-academic collections, we have the Bank of Canada has a large collection in the museum there as well. And I'm in contact and in collaboration with the curators there as well. And then we have a large museum in Ontario, which is Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. And that museum has a large collection as well. I've also toured the collection, spoken uh, with curators, but the collection operates very differently. And based on what I've heard and what I've also heard when I've spoken with different faculty as well in the city of Toronto and University of Toronto, is that the collection is not as open for research and, and teaching. Actually, I don't think they ever used it for teaching uh, as what we've done at Calgary or at the Calgary, with the Calgary collection. So we have, and also McGill and McMaster have some collections as well. And I always love to hear what exists in Canada. And that is something that I'm really passionate about. And it's on my bucket list to create some kind of association of Canadian numismatic collection, collections and to really connect the curators and scholars that work with the collections um, much better than as it is right now. I was actually also able to tour the collection at the University of Saskatchewan, so that was uh, really great to see the talk uh, that um, Tersin did uh, a while ago, a few days ago, or weeks ago. We also have artifacts that are part of the collection, but maybe not necessarily connected with money or history of money. However, we call this part of our teaching collection and they're used in classes as well, especially for ancient history, art history. We have some Greek vases, Roman glass, uh, lamps. We have um, some medieval military um, oil grenades. We have a few cuneiform tablets and so on. And students are absolutely excited to be able to see these artifacts and um, even handle these artifacts, because unfortunately in Western Canada, we actually do not really have any collections um, that relate to the ancient world. So I felt where, when donors come to me and offer these collections, I, I feel like moral obligation to take them because this is the only place that these collections can find home and especially in, uh, in, at the research university and this educational institution, I think it's absolutely important to have any artifacts that we can have so that we can enable uh, education in best uh, ways possible. Um, as I mentioned, we, we purchase a lot, but I have a very strong connection with collectors and dealers and hobbyists and enthusiasts in Alberta and Calgary, but also beyond. Uh, this is George Mance, who just uh, in 2019 donated his Yap Stone to our collection. So I was extremely excited about that. And he was actually the one that donated the other elements or the other artifacts in the pre-colonization uh, collection. So really amazing support from the community. Our collection is mostly online, like maybe 90, 95% of the collection is digitized and it's all available in our database. The database is lacking a lot, um, not the best, 
and we are working in at this very moment we are working at changing it and updating to possibly cortex and other databases that are used for digital collections in the library the the images they've been in works for two three decades and then also adding the new ones right now and replacing the older ones so we have better resolution we have better photography and i'm very grateful to Brittany Demone, who works with me on uh, she's a graduate student, a student in classics. She's just about to finish. So we work extensively on digitizing the collection. We have um, really nice equipment. We've been able to get support from the library and from the donors. And then Brittany has been photographing and editing the images for months. And both Brittany and I have art history background. So we've been playing a lot with photography. Uh, Brittany, by the way, also took the photography course that was offered by American Numismatic Society. She loved it, she learned a lot. That was beyond my scope, so I kind of left that to her. But we've been playing a lot. These are just a couple examples of some images with the coins, just to try and look at them in a little bit different light and to represent the collection in different ways that maybe hasn't been done in the past. And, and also just to connect with the community and students as well um, by, by doing different things. I do teach a lot. This is a really big component of my work. And this is something that I personally believe it's really important and it's my personal mandate. There are no specific requirements for the curators of the collection and the other two curators at the nickel. We basically tailor our own interests and our own um, tasks and how we work. But for me personally, teaching has always been really important because of also my personal experience, because when I did my undergrad and, and grad degree, my master's uh, at the university, I worked with a collection and I only found out about a collection accidentally because I got a job at the museum in the store. And I had to quit really soon after that because I was spending all of my money at the store because as, a, as an employee there, I had a discount. So I quit that pretty fast. And, but because of that, I was able to learn about the, the museum. I was able to learn about the collections and I connected with Geraldine Shimeri Russell, who was the curator at the time. We collaborated a lot. I did a lot of work with her. And uh, so when she retired, she uh, recommended me for the position. And then um, I was fortunate to, to continue uh, in this post. So I teach from large, uh, classrooms of like sometimes 300 students, usually more common one is between 50 and 80 that are the most common classrooms, but they also go to introductory classes where there are like 300 students there. And I have calculated just recently, I was doing some stats and in the last seven years, I have directly and indirectly talked about uh, the collection and connected with students about 10,000 students at least. So I teach between like 40 and 50 uh, uh, lectures each year. When we went uh, online, that was a really interesting experience and I wanted to continue teaching with a collection and I did not want to stop um, doing that just because maybe we were not able to handle the coins. So I was, I, I was able to, to continue in almost similar capacity virtually on Zoom. And every I always offered to students to come and see the collection if, the, if there was interest, anything that interested them. And I also made sure to include a lot of imagery of coins like being held in the hands and so that the students can actually get an understanding of the scale of the coins we're talking about. When I go to classrooms, I usually take some coins with me and the number of coins varies depending on the size of the classroom. In large classrooms, I usually just bring the coins and students can, who are interested, line up at the end of the classroom, at the end of the class, and then they come and look at the coins and talk to me. Sometimes we stay even an hour 
after the class finishes. For the, uh, for the other classrooms, I actually pass the coins in protective plastic sleeves that are sealed, and I pass them through the classrooms, and with the help of TAs and instructors, we just make sure everything is uh, done properly and safely. So the for me, again, personally, teaching with a collection was extremely important and opening the collection to students to be able to see the coins um, closely, to handle them, to really experience them on a very different level. So it was finding that balance between safety and access. And I've never had any issues. We always have an agreement that um, I propose to the students at the very beginning of each class. We agree on how this is going to work and I have never ever had any issues. Students are really excited and very grateful to be able to, to, um, to do this because they do understand how privileged uh, this experience is. Uh, I also offer a lot of practicums. We have practicums through the museum, uh, museum and heritage studies program. And we have just opened practicums last year through Greek and Roman studies and history department. So we have uh, three different departments that have specialized courses in numismatics practicums. I can only take a very limited number of students. And right now I am pretty much full all the way, like. Uh, spring 2023 is already full. So the interest is huge and I, I really try to accommodate as many students as possible. And I also do direct studies and, um, and, and different things. Um, I was also very fortunate to receive the federal funding for something they call transformative talent internship. And um, so Brittany, who was doing a lot of research with me, then received an internship. We worked extensively for eight months, and then uh, she continued to work with me. Uh, afterwards, we received some funding for her to continue um, her work, and we are, still, uh, we are still working on the photography project. Research project with students, uh, this is Scott Coleman. He's actually now doing PhD at the uh, Carleton University in Ontario. And his focus is uh, Byzantine coinage, and he's actually incorporating the study of the collection in his, uh, in, in, in his dissertation. Exhibitions. So teaching exhibitions, those are the next uh, really important elements. So when I started in 2014, at this point, actually, unfortunately, Geraldine was already gone for about five years. And um, Geraldine had a very different focus. She was very connected with uh, Canadian Mint. She was connected with um, Bank of Canada and her focus was slightly different. Um, so we obviously had exhibitions in the past. However, there hasn't been a lot of a close connection with the campus community. And I decided to start small. We have this window, uh, which is right, that's the entrance that looks at the pond. And then actually this is um, a, a hallway through the library on the other side is the cafe and the information desk and, and so on. And then the hallway continues to the right side and there's um, exit on the other side to the other side of campus. So we have incredible traffic that goes through here. And uh, the nickel has this window that I decided to start using for my first exhibitions or exhibits. Uh, because I really wanted to start building very slowly this uh, awareness of the collection, the interest into the collection. And I didn't wanna start with a big exhibition in the gallery. No, I personally really did not believe that anybody would come because at this point, nobody knew anymore about the collection. It was, it, it was like a best kept secret on campus. So I, I thought this was the best place to start and it, it did really pay off. Like I did a, a few exhibitions. This was the first one, some money through the ages. And um, then this was another one with uh, ancient world money and religion. Um, my personal favorite, I absolutely love um, this subject matter, and I work a lot with religious department as well, so it's really interesting to do that. Just some close-ups of the, um, of the display, 
And this was another one, what is money? So you can see the scope of the collection is absolutely huge. And my background, is a, as you've heard, is art history and ancient Greek and Roman world. But with the collection that starts from, you know, um, even if we look at, look at cuneiform tablets, like a couple thousands of years, like a couple, two millennia BCE, to the modern period and everything in between, um, I, I really see it as incredible privilege to be able to learn and work with all kinds of uh, objects and, and subject matters. So I've learned so much and I try to connect with different areas on campus and different research that would then um, really uh, work nicely with different type of collections. So this is a little bit different because I am mostly one person show and, uh, and the collection is so vast and I am responsible for all of it. And I do wanna do justice to all of the, uh, all of the artifacts in the collection. So I work with everything. Um, we have really hard <laughs> copyright laws in Canada, not able to take photographs of students unless we have written permissions. So I, I try to, get permissions as much as possible. So these are just some of the images that I'm able to include. But as I mentioned, the, the strategy worked. The students just were enthralled by the exhibitions, they were there. And they would come and they would stay there. And I would often stand by the window and engage them and talk and just, it's, it's for me personally, it's such an incredible experience to promote the collection and to see the joy on students' faces when they learn about but all of the artifacts that we have here on campus. I also collaborate with different scholars on campus in any way that we can incorporate coins. We do that. This is Maria Zutarek from the English department. And uh, she had this exhibition on book dissected. She was looking at the books and she also had some books uh, numismatic uh, books that are from our special collection. So I contributed to that. So just one of the examples of the scope um, of, of my work. And then finally in 2019, I felt confident that I could do an exhibition inside the gallery that people would come. Uh, and, and for those of you that may have experience with museums and work in the museum field possibly, it is a really interesting world because it, it takes time to build that relationship with the community. So campus community and city community and beyond. And, uh, and, and it takes a long time to sort of create that, that, that trust and, and just affection for the collection. And, and it worked. It was really an incredible um, exhibition. This was the exhibition Money in Calgary. It uh, was organized together with the Royal, um, Royal Canadian Numismatic Association uh, headquartered in, in Ottawa. And there was a convention here in Calgary hosted by the local society, Calgary Numismatic Society. And then I received funding to, uh, to organize this uh, exhibition and other programming and events that happened along with it. So it, it was really incredible. There were a lot of events that happened on campus and people came. It was, it was true joy. I also worked uh, on this exhibition with four graduate students from uh, Greek and Roman studies and religious studies. And each student curated their own area. And then we, uh, we also wrote a, a, a catalog. We, we were also fortunate to receive the funding to publish a catalog, beautiful, gorgeous images. It's also available on um, my Academia EDU page. But if anybody is ever interested in receiving the catalog, please just email me with your address. I'm happy to ship it. We do not charge for any of that. It's, it's really a, just promotion. And we want to, again, engage as many people as possible. This is the latest exhibition that was planned for 2020. Unfortunately, we had to cancel that. We were closed. And then as soon as we received the permission to open, 
Uh, this is the current exhibition, Money Zoo, Fantastic Beasts in the History of Money. So the exhibition deals with uh, human connection with animals through the history of animals on coins, animals on money, and animals as money. And it includes everything from you know, ancient, uh, what is 7th century BC to the modern period. And you can see as well the, the beaver uh, pelt right in the center. And uh, here's another view of the exhibition. This is on the main floor. And our walls, as I mentioned, are movable, very flexible. We have um, a group of technicians that are absolute ma magicians. They're uh, incredible support. And this is the view of the current uh, exhibition. Uh, during COVID, I also then extended to online exhibition, so virtual exhibition, and the first one was the Coins of Jesus, because there has been the most interest um, locally in this topic. Uh, so that's what we what we did. It's available publicly. It's on the you know uh, Nickel website, and then this is currently we have done big programming, and everything is available online for this exhibition. We have three talks, including the virtual or the online uh, or, um, Zoom talk about the exhibition uh, and the tour of the exhibition. And there is also a virtual uh, exhibition online or, or overview of the exhibition. Programming, uh, quite extensive. We organize talks. At the museum, we have something which we call Nickel at Noon. Every Thursday at noon during the term, we organize talks um, and we, we include all of uh, the collections. So we have speakers for art, for rugs, and for um, numismatics. So this is one of the, the talks that was there. And I, I'm also part of something with, uh, in classic, which is called uh, Friends of the Mediterranean Studies. And we also bring speakers uh, in, in um, collaboration with the museum. So this is one of the talks that was held there. And then we also moved online. And I was really happy to be able to connect with uh, Dr. Amelia uh, that were from the, from the British Museum. And, and we had other talks, so, and more in the future. So we do, I do a lot of exhibition tours. I do a lot of uh, collection tours and anything that pretty much comes my way, I have a policy of yes. Um, it can be quite a hard policy because there's a lot of work. Uh, however, I truly enjoy my job and it does not come as a chore. And, uh, and I really like, uh, exposing the collection as much as possible. So we often do include the tour of the collections and exhibitions for any delegates that come to campus or anything that is requested from the president's office or at, at anything else that happens on campus. Um, we have numismatics exhibitions once a year. And then outreach and engagement Along with, uh, with my work with the campus community, I've expanded beyond the campus walls and do a lot of work in the city as well. So we have the, this big science center, it's called Telus Park Science Center, and they have something which they call uh, adult nights. Uh, happened, I think it was on Thursday, once, uh, once a month on Thursdays. So this event was called Kaching and it was incredible. We had over 300 people that just stopped to talk to me for my display of the collection. And again, um, you can see like also the, the artifacts that are chosen for these displays are the ones that uh, are part of our teaching collection and handling collections and so on. And, and uh, again, the connection with the community has been incredible. So this was, an, uh, this was yeah, Kaching and I done another uh, event there as well. So any uh, any connection with any institutions in the city is is wonderful for me. Uh, we're also very closely connected with the Calgary Public Library and give lots of talks in person and then online. And as you can see, yes, my range of topics is really wide. 
I just actually recently gave a talk a topic about the origin of Bitcoin and Yap Stone money, and this was the one about money banking and the birth of modern art. And they're all as well available on my Academia EDU page, and and uh, Nickel what, the YouTube and so on. I do uh, small and big engagements, and all of them are a tremendous joy. I go to like senior luncheons in churches and I was doing the religious talks it's said really popular in the community so I've been doing like everything I've been to uh, I go to synagogues I go to different societies I was I was part of many uh, conferences including the one that is coming now in April which is a big uh, medieval conference happening in Banff which is uh, a little mountain village uh, close to Calgary I work with children as well. Um, that is not something that comes naturally to me. I, I, I connect much better with adult audience, but I've been asked multiple times and I really thought this was very important to start building that connection with numismatics when you know children are still young and they collect, uh, they see these things. So I've been doing a lot of history of money sessions at different libraries in the city. And then we started the, um, the camp that is then specifically for the museum and the library because University of Calgary offers summer camps. So this is what we've been doing. And this is a uh, image from last year's camp. It's, it's been really incredible. And I also uh, am director of the Youth uh, Coin Club here in Calgary, which is part of the Calgary Numismatic Society. So once a month, we do sessions uh, with children. And for me, again, it's really important they're educational. So they are children that love to collect coins uh, and money in general, but we do all kinds of sessions that also include a lot of uh, learning and education. And parents are really happy. They're also free, everything is free. The Calgary Numismatic Society, the, the collaboration and the partnership is extremely important. These are uh, part of the, the board of the, of the Calgary uh, Numismatic Society. And they've been extremely supportive. Uh, we received large donations in 2019, and there's a, a, a big one coming right now in April. They have uh, given a few, um, no, like about $40,000 for us uh, to purchase the RCNA library, which is Royal Canadian Numismatic Association. So it's the main library in Canada. Um, and for various reasons, they are selling the library and the, the society is giving the money to university, to the Nickel Galleries, to purchase this incredible library and then incorporate it into our holdings. So which will bring then the, the Calgary collection um, in a really unique place because we will have this incredible library. We already have extensive library, but this will definitely be a next level. And then the, the, the coin collection as well. Extensive work with local dealers and collectors. This is Robert Kirk Taylor, who is also uh, on the board, the Nickel Board and the Collections Committee, um, helping with different acquisitions and, and so on. So it is really, really important to me to go beyond academia and to connect with all levels uh, of numismatic society and to be very inclusive. Um, this is, uh, again, George Mance, an, an event that we organized, an educational event, and, and so on. And then uh, with COVID, I was pushed into that online world, which I personally was never really part of, but I, I really believe that I, that I needed to use this space uh, to extend um, beyond just Calgary in Canada, but to to do more and to be visible um, in the online world. And it has been absolutely incredible. I've been able to connect with many um, curators from ANS and the British Museum and other places in Berlin and, and, and so on. So it's been truly incredibly rewarding. And uh, I'm looking forward to uh, connecting with many of you that I do not know yet. 
I, I also do a lot of media. It is not something that I really enjoy. <laughs> I've, I've never been very interested in, um, in doing like filming or radio interviews or anything like that. But I, again, say yes. And um, by now I'm kind of like immune. I, I don't really care about being embarrassed anymore. Uh, so this is the, the latest interview that I did with the radio. I did a, a different interviews with CBC, which is the Canadian national uh, radio and, um, and television program, channel, institution. I'm not really sure, but uh, Canadian broadcasting company and uh, or corporation, sorry. So this is national. So in every single place, where there is radio signal or TV signal, people have this channel and it, both radio and TV, and it is actively listened. People really cherish uh, the programming. So I've done a bunch of stuff for CBC, different interviews, uh, videos, part of documentaries. Uh, I also done like some filming and short videos for university. I just finished um, filming something for, um, for an indigenous channel um, about um, coins and, and, and exhibitions and mythology, which is going to be part of some documentary series. And next Thursday, I'm filming something else. So I definitely try to engage in many, many different things. So this is just a very brief overview of, um, of things I do. And um, so, yeah, I just, I as far as I understand, sorry, let me just move this. So as far as I understand, we are the, the most active numismatic collection in Canada, and it's, it's just growing exponentially. And, uh, and then I also love to hear what other people are doing and different experiences, learning from everybody. So thank you so much for being able to come and, uh, and share this this with you so I mean, I have we, time for questions and just more discussion i'm happy to do that yeah i, I just want to jump in here and say thank you very much um it, it's always fascinating to see what our colleagues are up to in other places and to get an insight into other collections as well too and this has been fantastic i, I gotta say i'm anxious to make my way up to Alberta at some point and, and see all of this. But um, uh, if we have any questions, uh, please um, uh, raise your virtual hand and uh, feel free to ask Marina uh, anything at this point. Uh, I see that Rick Belson has got his virtual hand up. Rick? Hi, first of all, uh, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. I am ab absolutely stunned. I had no idea that, uh, that your collection and gallery even existed. So, and, and just from the sample of slides that you presented, it looks like an amazing collection. Can you uh, give us some sense as to how the nickel collection was formed over time? It looks like the nickel family must have been purchasing coins from like the top auction houses in the, in Europe. Yes, thank you so much. Um, nice to meet you, Richard. Uh, yeah, so um, Carl Nickel donated his mostly uh, ancient Greek and Roman coins. Uh, so 10,000 of those. And then a very good friend of his, Lionel Kahn, uh, who unfortunately just passed away uh, four months ago. and. He continued all these years for over 40 years to support the collection. And he was such an interesting personality. And I, I would meet with him every month and we would go for lunch and he would bring me new artifacts that would, he would find in his place. <laughs> and um, so, so yeah, and then he donated a, um, a really wonderful collection of gold Byzantine coinage and he donated a lot of other stuff. Um, all the way pretty much until the very end. So we got, so there was, um, so Carl Nickel, Lionel Kahn. Then we had a large donation of mostly ancient coins as well from Paul de Groot, another local 
um, collector. And what I find really interesting is that many of these collectors in the city are geologists uh, or work in the oil industry. Um, obviously, I mean, Carl Nickel, that was the oil family in Calgary. They published the, I think it was called Alberta Oil Magazine, which even in the 60s and 70s cost $1,000 per issue. It was, it was extremely important. So you can, you can get a sense of money that, that was flowing through the place. And, uh, and a lot of the people that work in the industry are really attracted to money, I guess, in different forms. So a lot of collectors. And so they would, they would also bequest their, uh, their collections, large or small. So Paul de Groot was one of the major donors that uh, left his collection to the nickel, to Geraldine. He was working with her closely. I've never met him. He already passed away. Then there are uh, smaller donations that came later on. We have some Asian, Asian coinage as well. So we, uh, we have every, so uh, we have um, origin of first coinage from Lydia and Ionia. Then we have all the, the Greek coinage, uh, bronzes as well as, as uh, silver pieces. And then we have, um, and, and, yeah, and French ones in Southern Italy. And we have, uh, and then we have Hellenistic ones starting with Alexander the Great. We have uh, actually a few coins from the Hunter collection were purchased. Uh, by a donor and then uh, the Hellenistic coins were, were given. Actually, Francois de Calatay uh, was, he's been connected with, with us and he came and gave talks. Um, physically, actually, he came to, um, to Calgary, gave talks for us and he examined the Hellenistic collection and, and we were told um, from his expertise that these coins are absolutely superb. Um, so we have that, the Hellenistic collection, we have a really large collection of Alexandria, the Ptolemaic coinage in Alexandria, we have like 19 trays of that. Um, then we have, uh, we have, uh, so Celtic coinage, Geraldine worked uh, also in Celtic area, she published some stuff and actually she, she, her study was quite influential and, um, she, she looked at the, the different ways how, uh, how Celtic coinage could be viewed and it's called a uh, Shimiri Russell effect. So we make marks. Um, and then, so Byzantine, a, lar a Roman collection, including a provincial bronze collection, medieval, and then it goes into the, um, into the modern period. So we have some French, English, German, some miscellaneous stuff. We have large collection of Dutch coinage, um, again from Paul de Groot, and then we have a collection of uh, Canadian uh, money history. So the Canadian money and some of the U.S. money also came from Carl Nickel. Carl Nickel split his collection into three parts. The ancient collection immediately came to University of Calgary. A Canadian collection went to a local, um, the Calgary Museum called the Glambo Museum. Uh, they have a, or they had a big Canadian archive. So the archive has also been transferred to uh, U of C and the collection actually came prior to the archive. So we have all um, Nichols second part of the collection. And um, and then the third part of the collection was given to a museum in Edmonton, which is the capital of Alberta, um, in Royal Alberta Museum. And those, I'm not 100% sure what exactly is there. I think it's a large gold collection of more like 1500s uh, to modern period. They do not have a curator. There's nothing really ever been done with the collection. So um, in my mind, and that's also on my bucket list is to join these three collections maybe sometime in the future. So it's very political, but we'll see how that works. This is a very long answer <laughs> to your <laughs> question. Um, so, but please, if I missed anything, uh, let me know. Mr. Marina, I, I have to say, I'm very intrigued by your 19 trays of Ptolemaic coins. We have to figure out a way <laughs> to get them hooked up to Ptolemaic coinage online. Yes, that is also on my list to connect, to 
to connect with other open source databases, yeah. especially now with all of the new photography that is available. Yeah. I would love to do that, yes. Yeah. Uh, Mary, yes. I see oh, go ahead, Rick. Yeah, as a follow up, mm -hmm. uh, these various lectures and so forth, if I go to your website, are they there, like the one on uh, money in the Bible? Can I watch it? Yes, of course. And I will enter here my email again. So you are welcome to email me with any inquiries. I'm actually quite good with at least initial response. I will reply to you right away. And I may say, I'll get back to you next week or so, but you will always receive a reply from me. Uh, so anything that I mentioned that you want to learn more about, you can do that. And the uh, um, EDU, um, so if you go there, and or even if you just search Marina Fisher, uh, there's, there's a lot of links. I also have the LinkedIn page. Um, yeah, academia. I have a research gate, but it's not as updated. I just haven't had time to work with this. Mm -hmm. And I also have, um, we post some videos as well on the, the Nickel website, uh, the Nickel YouTube channel, and I also have my own YouTube channel. Uh, Mary, I see your hand is up. Very I'll well. let you, Peter, um, decide the, the order. All right. I, I, okay. I know Hi, Marina, do you get any sleep at night? I mean, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> You're so busy. One of the questions that I wanted to ask was approximately how many square feet of um, museum space do you have for your larger exhibits? And how long does it take you to put them together? And how long are they up? Okay. I am so sorry. I didn't know the square footage. Uh, it's, it's quite big. I would say between three, uh, probably 4,000 square feet. Yeah. Okay at least 4,000 square feet. Um, so the, the way, it, like we have a lot of art exhibitions from the collection and um, curated and you know, loaned from other places. So the art exhibitions are up only for three to four months and then they change them. And uh, we, the rock collection about the same. Uh, with, the, with the numismatic exhibitions, we hold them longer, I absolutely insist, because so much work goes into curating this exhibition. So to have it up for just a few months is just not acceptable to me. So uh, about six months is what we do. But again, like uh, the gallery is really active. We have between eight and 12 exhibitions each year and everything is booked like two years in advance. Um, so and so the space can be sometimes a problem, but with the with the with COVID, we had to create a new space that the students could safely come in and exit. So this is where that room is, uh, how it was born, that Manizu room, which is right in the entrance to the left, and we added another wall and kind of section off part of the part of the space. It looks really nice. And uh, because, and it has two entrances, so you can enter and exit in a different place. And then we decided to keep it. And, um, and I said, I really love this space and I will most likely exhibiting in the future in that same space. Again, we will create it. Um, so yes, so yeah, a lot of work goes into the ex exhibitions. And uh, usually we do everything kind of in-house, but this time, because it was absolutely crazy, when we got a permission in the middle of December to open, uh, we had to wait from University of Calgary, it's different policies and laws. We literally had like one week and then Christmas break and then another week to open like four exhibitions at the same time. So we outsourced uh, like design and labeling. And then when we got the bill, <laughs> So there are 220 artifacts in the Money Zoo collection. The labels and panels were $7,000. I almost fainted. So we won't be doing that anymore. It's really expensive. Um, however, I tried to reuse my material as much as possible. Like all the labels, like everything, I, I keep everything. And when I do smaller exhibitions, 
um, either for conferences or different departments or different events, I, I reuse those, those uh, all the material that I can. Very good. Um, there's a question here from Mark Ames uh, asking uh, about your work on the cult of Aphrodite, um, asking if a city issued a coin that depicts Aphrodite, does it imply that there was a cult there? Um, so. Yeah, yeah, this was, uh, yeah, I did, um, I was originally really interested in ancient Greek uh, art and vases, and I wrote my giant 500-page <laughs> uh, uh, MA thesis on this. And, uh, and while I was doing that, I was looking at the images of headdresses specifically that women uh, showed up uh, in art. And then I was able to classify the different type of headdresses. And then I realized that a lot of headdress, like a certain type of headdresses appeared on hetairai, like the, the courtesans and the prostitutes. And, uh, and then this is what led me to look at the coinage um, of Corinth and, and looking at the headdresses uh, on nymphs and, and nymphs in, in Corinth and so, so my personal opinion, some people may get upset, but my personal opinion is that based on my research on textiles and headdresses and Greek um, pottery, is that the images of a female figure from Corinth with the headdress are Aphrodite, or at least in some way connected to Aphrodite, which then ex in my mind, I, I believe that depiction of helmeted female figure with the really beautiful curly hair is also Aphrodite. Yeah. Uh, it would make sense based on you know, my research. So, um, so that, and I, I, my thesis is online. I, I published articles on this as well. But if you want to discuss this further, I'm absolutely happy to do that. And um, yeah, well, so I, I think we're, we're going to have to have you back at some point, um, <laughs> both to talk about that as well as uh, Robert Ronas was uh, suggesting in the comments that we have you come back to uh, uh, do a presentation on the highlights from the nickel collection. Oh, yeah, I, would I think would be that. a great idea. Yes. I think that'd be a great idea. Um, uh, Warren Esty is asking, how are you doing for physical space? Do you have convenient shelf space for the new, uh, that new large collection of books that you were getting? Um, do the trays have a lot more room for coin expansion, I guess? Yeah. Um, I, I am the most fortunate of my colleagues because coins are small. <laughs> so I can put a lot of coins into that space. Um, I mean, pretty much all of the 300 drawers are full, but we also have some collections in uh, in the binders, like the Nodgale collection, the binders, and so on. So, and so, and then we have another new cabinet, which is uh, there's still a lot of space in it. Uh, so I'm not worried for the space. Um, we also have a, a a storage facility, like right behind the museum, like the galleries. We store art there and we store the, the rugs there. And I also, the, the Yap um, stone, I also store with art because of the different humidity that is uh, in, in the art storage versus the very dry storage in, of the, for the coins. Um, we also have some uh, wooden like axes and, and so on in the, in the pre-colonization collection. So we also, um, make sure that the, the, the climate and the environment is the best for each artifact. We also have a conservator, conservator or, on site who works with other special collections in the library. Um, so I am not worried about space at all. We have a, an off-site, off-campus, large building. Um, they call it state-of-the-art, <laughs> high-density library, HDL. Uh, where we have books and there's like um, at least 4 million books there. Uh, and then there are also some books on campus in the main library, but there has been a really big shift in, in learning. And uh, so 
it's a lot of online resources, a lot of digital. So the books that are in the library uh, change all the time, depending on what is being taught, what is being required and so on. But there's definitely thousands and thousands of books there as well. Um, so the library uh, will be stored in the high density library. And that is another, like, it has a really fascinating way of storing books. Uh, it is done by size and this technology is just incredible. They, uh, the books are in boxes and they're like cataloged and magnetized in different ways. And then they're all organized by size to maximize the space. And, and it, 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 it looks, if you're familiar with like um, Indiana Jones, you know, the Ark of Covenant, that famous scenes of, of the storage, it looks kind of like that. It just goes endlessly. Um, and there are just these boxes and boxes and boxes of books. And then they have different um, machinery, you know, that and robots that come and get the, the boxes up and down and stuff. So we have lots of space uh, for yeah. that, for sure. Uh, Peter Sugar, you had a question about labels. Yeah, thank you so much. It was very interesting. It's fascinating. And I noticed, Marina, that um, in that window exhibit in the lobby, they were like these like cards that looked like they were next to each coin. The question, of course, regarding coins as an exhibit is that they're difficult because they're tiny. And they're not four feet big, except for the yap money. <laughs> and everything else is miniature. And how do you, so I was thinking maybe you had larger photographs of that same tiny little object. Tiny, even a $20 gold piece is tiny when you're three feet away. Yeah. And you're looking through a glass. I was wondering if you had some kind of idea for that, because I think that could be used in so many institutions and so many exhibits you don't really get to appreciate the art because it's just physically too small. And, yeah. you know, tell me a little bit about just for a few seconds. Yeah. Thank you so much. And I do want to make sure that I answer Catherine's question. I just saw it because Catherine and I uh, connected over email, but we never met. So um, I, I will just go back quickly and I will open that slide. Um, with the exhibition so yeah this i'm kind of really proud of it <laughs> um because again like oh sorry coming into um numismatic field and museum field with maybe different background than usual and and i really believe it kind of gave me ability to think differently and I try to do that as much as possible in every in every situation. So again, it's coins are very hard to display, as we all know. Um, so this is what I did: like uh, scanned the coins, printed the color imagery. Um, I glued them onto the cardboard and then cut them out. And then I had these little holders uh, that I got on Amazon, like they're photo holders. And then the technicians like. Um, these ones were sprayed in silver and they were different sizes. They were adjusted. Uh, not every single uh, coin is, um, is here. It was just, I did have an image for every single coin, but it just was not obviously possible. But it, it, it created a different experience and drew in people. So I, I firmly believe that it's really important that we have to start thinking outside of the box, how we've been exhibiting coins. I do not have all the, I don't have answers. I, it's something that I'm personally working on. I um, like, for example, in the current exhibition, I provided um, the uh, magnifying glasses with light so that everybody, they're just there. So everybody can just grab them and kind of look through. And people are often usually excited to do that kind of stuff that feel like archaeologists on TV. Um, so yeah, but in, in a way there has to be a different way how to do this. And um, so even in the current exhibition, I also included some of those bigger images, uh, the cutouts of the coins, especially if the backside is not visible or something like that. Um, but yeah, 
I, I mean, again, I'm absolutely happy to maybe um, brainstorm further together and see what we can do with with different spaces. Like right now, I'll just tell you for the for the conference that is happening in April. Um, uh, one of the technicians, John, like build me a portable case. So the case is like big, like, I don't know, like it's, I'm so sorry, like it's maybe about a meter, meter, meter long about that. And, uh, and it has actually a plexiglass um, bottom and he embedded some LED lighting, LED lighting uh, underneath. So, and then there's obviously a plexiglass cover that is lockable. So what we're going to do is like put those little um, stands that you also seen in different photos and light the coins from the bottom. I haven't tried it yet, to be honest, but um, again, experimenting with different things and yeah, so uh, I'm, yeah. I mean, I've, I've got to say your, for lack of a better term, your coin lollipop idea is brilliant. And I, I took notes on that actually. And I think yeah, we, we might that. have to use that at some point. That. Yeah. So are, are there any other questions? I want, as I said, like, uh, Catherine, I saw, I didn't read the question, but I saw it briefly here. Mm. Yeah, Catherine from Victoria, BC. I've been listening to your presentation this morning and have learned a whole lot more about your enormous range of activities and the excellent connections you have forged with all sorts of individuals and community. Thank you, Catherine. Uh, congratulations on the excellent use of, okay. Yeah, uh, thank you, Catherine, so much, and for all those wonderful words. I, sorry, I thought it was a question. I didn't. I didn't get to to read the whole thing. Catherine helped me a lot. We've been emailing, and she's been uh, connecting with with some other scholars and numismatists at university. And I was able to bring Robert Beer from Win, uh, Windsor uh, for one of our Nicola Noon talks, and. Um, and I, I have all of you, if I mind. <laughs> so, so I will, I, yeah. And we also, uh, maybe this is a good time to advertise. Um, May 26th to 27th, uh, we are organizing a symposium that is together with the Money Zoo. And we had so many applications, uh, the abstracts. We, we thought that maybe just a short day would be enough, but it seems we'll have to extend it to two days. So please stay tuned. Uh, there are all kinds of incredible talks that are coming with that, and uh, I will share that. Uh, but please email me with any questions you have. So yes. Well, we're at the top of the hour. Um, uh, right Peter, now, I, I have a, a, a very quick oh, question. Sure, sure. Um, Go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you for a wonderful talk and a great introduction to the collection. By the way, Marina, is the Calgary Stampede still a thing? Yes, yeah, this is another way how Calgary is known really uh, on, on the world map. Uh, we have annual cowboy fair. It's called Calgary Stampede. It's a big real thing. Uh, it has a huge history and um, we have like a big grounds in the in the center of the city in downtown. Uh, with multiple like buildings and rodeos and cart racing and I, I i'm not part of the scene so i apologize um i do occasionally wear a cowboy hat because it's just super fun uh and the city just gets transformed during those nine days it, it is really fun time to to come to calgary so yes well, marina uh, i can't thank you enough this has been a, a wonderful hour spending with you very impressive uh, and we will certainly talk to you about having you back for another lecture on either Aphrodite or highlights of the collection or something else. But I, I again, just really want to thank you. This has been wonderful. So. Thank you, everybody, so much. It was incredible pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.